Hello everyone, welcome back. In this session, we're going to be looking at using the SDL image library to load in a PNG file and display it on the screen, and then look at how we can rotate the image in a static way. Later on, of course, we will be controlling the rotation with key inputs. For now, let's check that we have the code from the previous tutorial running as expected. So if we type cargo run, it should look like this. If it doesn't look like this, then you can do git checkout tutorial 2 on the command line to get this code from the tagged repository. The first change we need to make is to the cargo.toml file to add in a reference to the image library for SDL. We just add that to the list in the dependencies.sdl section. This will allow us to load PNG files. Inside the source folder, we need to take a copy of the texture manager file from the GitHub repository. This file was copied and modified from the original SDL Rust source code examples. A link to this is found in the notes as well as in the GitHub readme. We need to create a file called texture underscore manager dot rs and copy the code into this file. The workings of this file is the subject for another video, but for now it will allow us to load and cache images easily. Next up, we need to get the image from the GitHub repository. The image is of a spaceship and needs to go in a new folder in the root of the project, next to the cargo.toml file, called img, short for image. And we can open that file to check it appears, and it does. It's a rather crude drawing, but it will do for now. Now we will be making some changes to our main.rs file. If we scroll up to the top, we can add a reference to point, which is in the same sub package as rect, which we are already using. And we will import the texture manager we just added by using pubmod texture manager and that will pull in the texture manager to the main crate. We will be adding some changes to the render function, but first we will create some constants that we'll reference later on. This isn't a practical way to manage lots of images, but for way of demonstration, it works to have them like this. In a future tutorial, we will introduce a better way of managing this. They are image width and image height, which are 100 and 100. Both of these are U32 because they can't be negative. We'll also specify the output width and height, which we'll leave as 100 for now, but we can modify it later to change the size of the image drawn. We will also add the screen width and screen height in as constants because they will make centering the images a little clearer. They are 800 and 600 respectively. We need to create an instance of the texture manager so that we can use it to load images. We'll create this near the texture creator as these things are linked and the texture manager requires the texture creator to build. And because we will be modifying it, it needs to be mutable. After this, we load our images. This allows the texture manager to cache the image and not try to do a load during our main loop. If it did do this, it could potentially judder on the first cycle and we should avoid this if we can. Normally, a texture manager would dynamically load and unload images as they are needed in a scene, but for our game, we don't have this complexity, and so we can safely load all images into memory for use within the game. Next up, we will need to pass the texture manager to the render function, and it will also need to be mutable. Then we need to update the function signature to include this reference to a texture manager object. We will call it texture underscore manager for consistency, and it is a mutable reference to a texture manager object with a type of window context. Because we will be removing direct calls to the texture creator and font variables, for now at least, we can put underscores in front of those arguments to prevent the compiler from complaining about them. We will reinstate them in a later tutorial when we create a heads up display. Next up, we're going to remove all of the text drawing code we had last time, leaving us with a blank canvas. The first variable we create will be a way of describing the source image that we are taking from. We'll call this src for source. It describes the image in this file. We do this with a rect by calling the new constructor and passing in the dimensions. If you're using a sprite sheet, for example, you can take a snapshot of the image along this list of images to create an animation frame. But for now, our image only has one frame. Then we find the x and y position of the image we are placing. We will create these by dividing the screen dimensions over two and putting it in the center of the screen. 
Next, we create the destination rect, which allows us, if we choose, to change the dimensions of the image before we apply it to the canvas. We are going to reference the X component, the middle of the screen, but subtract half of the image width so that it is centered on the middle of the screen. And the same thing for the Y component. The width and height of the image are the output width and height. Then we need to create a variable to hold the center of the image in relation to the top left corner of the image. This is necessary for the copy function in a second, because we copy the image onto the canvas. The center is just a point with the middle coordinates of the image, width and height over 2. The last variable we need to create is the reference to the actual texture, which we get by calling our texture manager and getting the image. We call the load function with the path of the file. Finally, we're ready to bring this all together and tell the canvas we would like to draw this image. We previously used canvas.copy, but this time we're going to use the extended copy function, copy underscore x, which gives us more control over the image placement. The first argument is the texture object, the second is the source rect, the third is the destination rect, the next variable is the angle of orientation, we'll have a play around with this later, the center variable is next and is the point we created above, the next two variables are flip horizontal and flip vertical, which we don't want to do, so we'll set them to false. With all that done, let's try and run the code. We have some errors back, there is a missing semicolon, and we want to ignore the return result. We've done that twice. As we can see, our spaceship is being displayed in the center of the screen. So we close that down, and now we can change the rotation by changing the value to 90 degrees, saving the file, and rerun it. And we can see the spaceship is now in a different rotation, 90 degrees to be exact. We can also try resizing the image by changing the output width and height constants, but still in the center. And let's add an angle of 279 degrees. And we can now see the spaceship is smaller and facing an angle of 279 degrees. So, we've managed to get an image to display on the screen and control the rotation and size of the image. In future tutorials, this will form the basis for moving the player-controlled ship and other entities we will be using. For now though, I hope you've been able to make sense of it, and if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below, and I'll wish you goodbye for now. Take care of yourselves. Oh.